students of mine that have survived studying with me mm. and students of mine that are about to have to survive studying with me, <laughs> they know they have to be in the habit before they go to play, this is the sound I want to make, this is how it goes. And if you can't answer those two questions, you have no business putting the mouthpiece anywhere near your face. If you guys want to support the creation of these videos, consider becoming a Patreon subscriber or buying any of my merch linked below. I also have a Discord server if any of you want to chat with me. I also have a subreddit if any of you want to share interesting articles containing information that could be useful in a future video. Michael Mulcahy was born in Sydney, Australia, and as a result of being born in Aussie, employs the nickname Mick. Despite being born into a musical family, he instead had a strong desire to play rugby. That was until his brother started playing the cornet at the Holy Cross College. One day, the band played a Henry Mancini medley, and someone named Paul Kellett played the trombone solo in Baby Elephant Walk, which blew Mick away. <laughs> Mick then picked up a trombone and wanted lessons, so his dad hooked him up with an old friend from his schooling days, Baden McCarran of the Sydney Symphony. By the time Mick was 14, he knew he wanted to become a musician. In his first years, Mick always recognized that wherever he played, he was always the worst trombonist. As bad as that sounded, it never discouraged him. I think it's for others to judge my efficacy as a teacher. I will tell you this, I'm a very observant person. If I play with someone, I notice everything and I appreciate what another person's doing, even what my students are doing. Therefore, he was inspired and worked hard to become a better player. Mick then auditioned for the Conservatorium High School in Sydney, where students get lessons from the entire low brass section of the Sydney Symphony. Mick's proficiency on trombone still lacked, but because there weren't many trombonists pursuing symphonic playing at the time, he got in. During his time at the Conservatorium, he had many notable music engagements. One such was a six-week tour with the Daily Wilson Big Band, and another was spending three months as acting principal trombone of the Sydney Symphony. These early opportunities really threw me into the deep end, but when you're young, you can survive almost anything. It gave me the sense that nothing was impossible. Nothing was impossible, indeed. At just the age of 18, Mick won the principal trombone position with the Tasmanian Symphony, located in Hobart of the island Tasmania, south of Melbourne. <laughs> Some of Mick's highlights with the Tasmanian Symphony included premiering the Sonata for Three Trombones to Percussion and Timpani by Richard Mills. <laughs> as well as playing the Albertsberger Alto Trombone Concerto. Just a few months later, an opening for the principal trombone position at the Melbourne Symphony, among the country's best orchestras, was announced. Mick figured he had a long shot at getting it, but he went for it anyway. There were several things he did to prepare for the audition. First, he had already been practicing eight hours a day, spreading it throughout the entire day. He also sent cassette tapes of his excerpts to a past teacher at the Sydney Conservatory, Jeff Bailey, who would write back several pages of detailed comments. He also worked with the pianist extensively so that they were ready when the day came. Lastly, Mick Mick knew he was going up against seasoned professionals, so he chose to play ambitious solo repertoire. This included the first movement of the Soraki Concerto, the first movement of the Two Dances by De Fay, and the first movement of the Albertsberger Concerto on Alto Trombone. <laughs> During the audition, Mick did something unusual. After he played the first two pieces, the judges thanked and excused him. But instead of leaving, he felt the urge to play his third piece, so he insisted on playing it. The judges said, No thank you, we've heard enough. Mick then explained that his third piece was for alto trombone. The judges said, Oh no, that's not necessary. We might hear some excerpts later on alto. Mick still wouldn't leave the stage and explained how musical his third piece was. The judges finally gave in and said, Alright, just play it. <laughs> 
After all was said and done, Mick won the job. And if anyone out there is even thinking about employing this strategy at their next audition, don't. If I had done any of what I just described today, I would never win a job. If you listen to a great player play, you will hear beautiful, clear, pure sound that sounds effortless. And the reason it sounds effortless is because they've found that sweet spot between structure and energy. So when you're doing it right, it's quite close to doing nothing. Mick spent four years with the Melbourne Symphony. It was also during this time when he met his eventual wife, who played third horn with the orchestra, Gabrielle Webster. Throughout his time with the Melbourne Symphony, he heard from friends who moved to Europe to play in European orchestras. In the interest of broadening his horizons, he decided to apply for a study leave. Unfortunately, the application was ignored and got no response. The administration of Australian orchestras at the time was centralized, corrupt, and incompetent. There had been salary, personnel, and audition corruption issues. Rather than accept being shunned by the administration, he and Gabrielle quit their jobs from the Melbourne Symphony and bought one-way tickets to Germany in January of 1981. As much as Mick wanted to play for an orchestra in Germany, just being able to audition for one requires an invitation. Then, the Cologne Radio Symphony Orchestra announced an opening for a principal trombonist. The solo horn of the orchestra, Andrew Joy, made it possible for Mick to audition. Mick won the job. Gabriel also joined an orchestra of musician refugees from Hungary. Mick then competed for the largest solo competition in the country in Munich, the ARD International Music Competition. After competing in 1981, Mick shared the grand prize with French trombonist Michel People from different countries would come up to me, Americans would come up to me and say, where did you study in America? And I said, well, I actually I haven't studied in America. And the Germans would say, so who was your teacher here in Germany? And I said, well, I did. And the French would come up and say, so exactly where did you study in France? And I said, you know what, I didn't study in France. So this is an interesting thing because I love different schools of playing. And I've never thought I want to I want to play the American way or I want to play the German way. I heard things that I liked in many different ways in different places and I am some kind of hybrid mm -hmm. and apparently not so objectionable that people think that I'm incompatible with the way that they play. After seven years in Germany, he and his now wife decided to move back to Australia where they felt was the best place to raise their kids. Mick then got his first full-time teaching job at the Australian National University in Canberra. He was confident that was how he would spend the rest of his career. But as you're about to find out, it wouldn't be. During his second year in Canberra, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra was touring Australia. And what reason did Mick have to care? Turns out when Mick competed at the ARD competition, he met Joe Alessi who was one of the other competitors. And since Joe was also good friends with Charlie Vernon, then bass trombonist of the Philadelphia Orchestra, they played trios there. Therefore, knowing Charlie was in town with the Chicago Symphony, Mick caught up with him and the rest of its trombone section. After they played quartets at the Sydney Opera House, Charlie explained to him that Frank Crisofoli was going to retire and that there would be an opening for for second trombone. Mick didn't take the idea seriously at first, but he later got a letter from Charlie saying, you've got to get yourself over here. Work your ass off on this. This list is going to be very tough, and there will also be second trombone excerpts, a lot of first, and a lot of bass. During his audition for the Chicago Symphony, something interesting happened. And no, he did not insist on playing more after being thanked and excused. Here's what happened. I auditioned on the morning and I thought very seriously about a few things. The first thing was what to play because if you got into the finals, you got to choose a solo piece. And I knew in America, they don't give you long to play. In Germany, when you play, you play at least a whole movement or two of your solo work. That's the first thing you do is you play music. Mm -hmm. Whereas here you play three or four or five excerpts. If you don't screw anything else up, then they'll let you play music for a minute. So it's completely backwards. I didn't want to play anything that anyone else would play. So I wasn't going to play the Hindemith or the Creston 
or the Sulek. These were all very popular choices that most people, you know, I could hear people warming up. That's what everyone was playing. And I had a thought about that. If you got to choose something and you only got to play for a few minutes, what piece of music would show something exceptional? So I got down to two very different pieces. And I think if I got this choice wrong, I wouldn't be in the CSO. The two pieces I chose were the Queen of the Night aria from the Magic Flute, which doesn't seem very appropriate for the second trombone. But I figured if they're hearing a whole bunch of excerpts, why would I play something that is addressing the same part of the instrument or the same type of playing, like some of these very wonderful pieces like the Sulek or the Hindemith, almost symphonic in a way. I was pretty confident no one else would do that. The other piece I was thinking of was a piece I love by Hindemith, who he wrote for the viola called the Trial Music. The reason I love this piece is because it's a very emotional piece and it's only like six minutes and there are four movements in six minutes. So if they only let me play for four or five minutes, I can show different things. I can show different elements and different emotions and different techniques. I think if I'd chosen the Magic Flute, knowing what I now know, Chicago Symphony, especially back then, pretty conservative group. And that would have been, who is this? What? Why does he think we care whether he can play that or not? It would have been laughable. Even if I played it well, I thought I played it pretty nicely, but I think it would have been a terrible choice. It just goes to show you, you know, wisdom is not only good judgment, it's also being lucky enough to make the right call. Having been first trombone in three orchestras previously, I did not really appreciate what the second was doing. I was always grateful that they were great players, but I didn't really understand the substance of their role. And sitting in the chair, I realized that I could hear everything much better sitting in the middle than on the end. Sitting on the second chair affects you much more than it affects you sitting on the first chair. Sitting in the middle, you're a bit of a unifier. You're, you're the conduit to the people around you and you can give, uh, I think, good feedback to both ends of the section. I think the most important thing, people you know, talk about having a, a rich, dense sound to support the first and being able to blend with the low end and being brilliant at the high and all those kinds of things. But the main thing is just to bring everyone onto the same page. Throughout his career, Mick has had three teaching engagements. The first was during his second year in Melbourne, where his first student, Tim Dowling, won his first job in Tasmania, then the Sydney Symphony. The second was in 1987 at the Australian National University in Canberra. In fact, three of the four trombonists at the Sydney Symphony were students of his at Canberra, and ten years after winning his audition in Chicago, he got a teaching job at Northwestern University. One of his first students was Toby Oft, who went on to become principal trombone of the Boston Symphony. Mick has also had a number of students graduate from Northwestern to go on to have successful careers. Over the years in my teaching, particularly here at Northwestern, we've tried to distill all trombone knowledge to the most simple form. And I, I, I have had my students write essays on this and I, I, I've told them, I want you to be very precise and succinct. You know, the shortest essay wins pretty much. And we got it down to three words. Those three words were no, K-N-O-W, hear, H-E-A-R, and play. So before you want to play something, you have to know it. You have to know what it is that you want. And in order to be able to play what you know, you need to hear it. So you need to be able to hear what you know. And if you listen to what you hear, you can play what you hear. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe. Hope you all are doing well. I will see you in the next one.